All right, we're here with another episode of Around the County with Supervisor Jim Desmond. I'm Miles Himmel, Communications Director for uh, District 5. And today we've got a special guest, Dr. Ter Der Sorry, Taryn Clark. Let me retry that, Dr. Taryn Clark. Uh, Taryn, how are you? Thanks for coming on. Give the people uh, your background, if you don't mind. Fine, thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm a physician uh, from Orange County. I'm in Newport Beach, and I'm a cognitive specialist, so most of my patients um, are uh, suffering from Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So I have an older population of patients. And so I've been really doing my best to keep up on the pandemic and how it's affecting our communities because my patients are in fact the most at risk yeah. um, from having a severe course of COVID. So um, that's my background and where I'm coming from and, and why I'm excited to talk to you all today. Yeah, and we appreciate you coming on. Where, what have you seen over the last, gosh, now seven months? What what are you seeing? I mean, we've seen really quite an evolution. Of course, um, like everybody, we were terrified when this first came onto the scene and when it first arrived in California. Um, and, you know, towards the beginning, even when it really was hitting Orange County hard, and I'm, I'm more familiar with our statistics than San Diego's, although they're probably pretty similar, um, you know, back April, May, June, we were still seeing that in, in Orange County, if a nursing home patient went to the hospital with COVID, they had an 80% survival rate. So 20% mortality rate, that was pretty high. Um, although better than some of the statistics on the East Coast. Um, but now that's coming down to where we're getting to um, upwards of 90, even a little bit higher survival rates for people who have serious COVID and are hospitalized. So we're getting better at treating this even when it gets bad. Um, and then, you know, you may hear about the evolution of the virus itself and that viruses do tend to evolve towards um, causing less severe disease. And so I think many of my colleagues and I are observing that as well, that you know, for the young populations, if they get anything, it's kind of a cold. Sometimes it's like a flu at the worst, but um, we're starting to see a lot more of those mild infections. And I have not seen too many of my patients actually have COVID, um, and um, I've had no patients that have passed away from it. So that's, I'm thankful for that. Uh, that's very, what, well, one of the things I, it, it, we've been stressing here in San Diego County, or I've been stressing, is the fact that our hospitalization rates are, are very low. The, mm -hmm. It's only 7% of the people in the hospitals are, are COVID patients and only about, if you just take our, our overall capacity, we're, we're only at about 70% capacity uh, in, in our hospitals. That's with, with all the other people in there for other reasons. So we still have like 30% of our beds open right now. Right. And yet, unfortunately, we're moving backwards. We're at San Diego County, we just hit purple. And so if we hit purple for one more week, then, then unfortunately we have to start punishing our businesses over this and punishing, you know, shutting down indoor dining and, and uh, museums and, and uh, you know, the, uh, the, anything indoors basically is gonna have to go backwards. When, and, and it's just kind of frustrating to people to see, well, we have very few people actually getting ill from this, much fewer going to the hospital, even fewer people dying from before, but we're, because our cases, everything seems to be focused on cases now as opposed to our hospitalizations. I don't know, your position, do you have an opinion or thoughts? I completely agree with you. When we were in our old metric, um, I thought that was also too fo focused on um, cases. And so I thought maybe when we had this new iteration, it would take into account that cases is really not a metric that's reliable. The testing is unreliable, as we've seen. And you know, the only thing that matters, the reason we tried to flatten the curve was to not overwhelm our hospitals. That's really the only metric that we should be looking at is hospital capacity. A secondary metric would be um, death rate. So, you know, we've not been close to overwhelming our hospitals. And it's hard, I think, for the general public who don't spend a lot of times in hospitals, but people who do, we know, you know, when I think about the, um, I think it was 2017, 18, that was a bad flu year. And so, you know, we've seen it before where hospitals are stacked with three beds in each ER bay and, you know, the ER is on divert because there's no ICU beds left. I mean, that happens. The, the general population doesn't hear about it much, but the health system is used to that. There's some flexibility, there's diverting. You know, there, there is, even when the hospitals do get um, to capacity, there's a plan for that. And we've not been close to to that with COVID. So I really think that the hospital capacity numbers have been warped and to the lay person, you know, 85% of the hospitals being full sounds like a high number. No, that's, 
that's a good number that keeps the hospital profitable. We don't want hospitals to be empty. They, they can't stay open if they have low capacity. So, you know, to physicians, like 85%, Arizona, they were saying, you know, 88%, like that's, we're not in panic mode. You know, this is what happens when it's pneumonia season, it's flu season. So I really think we should focus back on the hospital, um, the uh, census rates, which are not a challenge and we should open things up. But using the cases, it's just, it's such a loose, unreliable metric. It's really shameful to rely on it. Well, and that's kind of, kind of where we are. Now, we had sort of an, an anomaly about a month or so ago, uh, early September, when um, San Diego State, one of our, our universities down here, San Diego State had, the students came back, the, they, they were living in the dorms, they're living in the housing around, around the, the uh, school, even though they weren't holding that many in-person uh, in classes. Uh, they, a lot of them came back and we had <clears throat> like a thousand, thousand plus students testing positive. And one went to the hospital and, you know, I was kind of harping on that. And the, but the pushback I got, and, and it was legit, is that, okay, these thousand students can spread this to grandma, grandpa, can spread it to the rest of the community. That's what the, the big issue was. We didn't really see it down, you know, I, I guess it's hard to track or trace that. Uh, but you know, it, it, that seems to be the major pushback is even though the younger people are getting it, they can still spread it, spread it to the older folks. And you're, you say your, your patients are mostly the el elderly, um, my age and older, but the, uh, um, so how do you, so I guess, what do you, what are your thoughts on, on, you know, the spread and has it come down with the, with elderly or, or, or holding the same or, or what? That's a good question. In um, Newport Beach, to be specific, um, I have not seen a lot of elderly people that have contracted this recently. And my um, recommendation to my patients and really all of my friends and neighbors since June um, has been, you know, June was really the time to have elderly be very careful and isolate. Um, and so they need to be cautious. Um, the kids, they don't get particularly sick. I mean, to talk about college kids, a lot of kids, especially if they're moving to campus and they're going to parties, I, I, you know, I've seen like people are taking pictures, especially in Arizona and things. You know, it's, those kids don't happen to interact a lot with older people. And so, you know, it, if we step back and we talk to like, for example, most of my patients who are grandparents, most grandparents would say, I don't want to be a burden on my family. You know, I want my grandkids to have the fullest life possible. Most of my patients who are grandparents would not say, I really want my children to have no life and not go to school because I might potentially get sick. Mm -hmm. Most of them have a perspective of I'm going to be safe. Um, and I shouldn't say safe. I should say low risk. That really should be the terminology we use because life has never been safe. Um, but what my patients are doing are making reasonable choices. And if they have a grandkid who's a teenager and they're out in the world, they are, they have to be social. Children cannot be isolated for this long. You know, they're meeting in the backyard and spending time together outside. You know, they're making good choices to decrease that risk. And there's no reason to think that sitting in their backyard at a distance of six feet, even without masks, um, is going to be a problem. It just doesn't transmit like that. So, um, you know, I think the vulnerable have to make very cautious choices for themselves, but thinking that we're really going to lock down 100% of people because there's this vulnerable population who are already making low risk choices for themselves. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of trying hard to burden everybody um, with their burden. And, and I find a lot of seniors actually don't want to burden society like we are. Well, how about, I don't know, Miles, if you have anything to jump in, but I'm just going to say, like vaccines, so we, we all, the masses think the panacea of the vaccine's gonna come in and cure us and, and then we're, we're over it. Even if we have a vaccine, I mean, we, don't we still have like some of these, the, the viruses like the Nile virus and, and, and the other viruses that, that were in existence, aren't they still sort of out there lingering? Well, some things like West Nile virus, um, we don't have a vaccine against West Nile. So um, yes, that one is still out and that's, a, that's one that comes with mosquitoes or from mosquitoes. Um, but we still do have flus and, and we still do have coronaviruses like we've always had. They usually produce colds. Um, the question is really the mutation. And so far this spike protein doesn't seem to have mutated. So that's good. The other um, you know, concept is it just depends how effective that vaccine is. Our flu vaccines are anywhere from 10 to 60% effective at, at preventing the flu each season. 
Um, so 60 at the best, and a lot of years they don't get you know, the, the exact flu virus that's coming correct. Um, and it still does overall decrease transmission of flu in the population, even if it's just a year where it's 10% effective. Um, so that's one thing to consider. Um, we just don't know how much is it going to rev up our immune system compared to people who already have it, actually. Their immune system is probably going to be much more revved up um, and able to fight it and have some memory in the immune system to fight it again. Um, so I'll be curious to see that. One of the things that has me concerned in terms of when we talk about masks, um, there are really some interesting ways to look at that. And one would be, why do we have people who have already recovered from COVID wearing masks? And then the question is always, well, because we don't know how long they're immune. So that's going to be even a bigger question regarding the vaccine. We can measure some of their immunity that comes in antibodies. We can't really measure another part of immunity called T cells, which I know is probably not what you wanted to talk about today in terms of that level of science. But um, you know, the question is then, if we have a vaccine that hopefully would be as effective as the flu vaccine, and that's only so effective, are we ever getting out of masks? Hmm. Because our COVID survivors aren't out of masks, and they would be more likely to be immune than somebody who's had a vaccine and we're not there. So that's where I always, I kind of wonder, you know, sometimes I have to question the mask stuff because, you know, if we're waiting for a vaccine, it's unlikely to be 100%. It will be taken by 100%, but do we ever get to take the masks off? I think well, it's a good question to think about. And, and like, there's no green uh, tier in, in, in the, this color-coded system. That there's no we green. <laughs> Uh, whoever, and I think you, 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 and I'm guilty of this myself, is I don't think I've washed my masks. So I am, uh, I should. You're not the only <laughs> one. That's very common. I have like a half of a dozen of them, and, you know, somewhere in the home, somewhere in my car, somewhere yep. in my office. And so I, I pick it up and, and I don't know if I washed it or not or which one. They're all the same color, so I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and you're in a pinch. You got to run into the market for something, so you grab one from under your seat. We are all guilty, no matter how clean we're being about them. We've all been in a pinch where we're like, oh, goodness. I Oh, shoot, good. There's one in between my seats. So it's, it's the way it is. It's a new habit for us, and it's hard to be as clean as we probably should be. Doctor. Well, there seems to be almost... Uh... Well, go ahead. Go ahead uh, well, I was just wondering, you know, something I've been kind of focused on here is, is and I don't know if you've said the mental health aspects. I know you were talking about your clients being older, older, yes. younger. We're, we're starting to see some numbers because you get that lag of numbers three, four months. You don't see the mental health right away. But uh, we're hearing horrific numbers of young people, like very young people thinking about suicide and, 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 and just really like horrific things. I, mental health aspect, can you, have you seen it? Can you touch on it? Yes, I've seen it across the board. Um, I see it in, I have uh, school-aged children. I see it in our community. I see it in um, the peers of my kids. Um, the, the devastation of the social isolation, they don't have a framework for it. And when you take 12 and 13 year olds and we run them through this for a year, which it almost has been now, it's such a significant part of their life. They don't know how to build hope that this could ever be reversed. They, they can't mental ninja themselves out of that. And so this last eight months for them has completely become life in their future. And so for a lot of them, it's really hard to hold out hope and they're just so worn down from it. And they're so isolated you know, kids begging to go to school that never liked school and they're crying. I mean, it's, it's you know, happy, well-adjusted kids who are getting into behaviors of cutting or um, trichotillomania, which is pulling their hair out. Um, a lot of these kind of pain release behaviors are rampant uh, in teenagers, but actually that tween group is super susceptible, like that seventh and eighth grade. So I think, you know, while I see a lot more depression in my elderly patients, I'm pretty, you know, aware of that. And it's always been under-recognized. So I think I tend to almost over-recognize it because I'm really surveilling and they are still seeking care. But I worry about those kids who, you know, they don't go to the doctor, but maybe once a year if it's time for vaccinations and a lot of pediatricians aren't seeing well kids right now. Um, and so, you know, is there anybody who is, looking under their sleeves for cuts. Is there anybody who's seeing the back of their hair and why they're always wearing a ponytail now and realizing that they have a huge 
bald patch, you know, it, it takes a bit of, kids are tricky about hiding it and, and they, there, there's shame on top of embarrassment, on top of loneliness, on top of boredom. Like it's just such a horrible mix for kids. It's really crazy that we're doing this to our kids. And then on top of it, you know, really taking away their identity with the masks, that, that is a big psychological piece of it. And you know, we say, oh, wear the dang mask, or oh, it's just a mask, it's not a big deal. It is a really big deal psychologically, especially for younger children, um, for communication. And, you know, that's one of the things that I encourage all my patients to, you know, I probably have more patients than anybody else in the state who've read the mask mandate. Um, the first, right when I fly into a new town, the first thing I do is read the mask mandate. I want to know if hearing impaired people are exempt because in most places we are, I'm hearing impaired. Um, it's hard for me to read lips um, with a mask, you know, when somebody's wearing a mask. And also in almost every municipal mask mandate, outdoors is exempted in, unless we can't distance. And so it's really important when we're walking around, maybe you've been up to Fashion Island, you can easily distance from people and we should be walking around without our masks on getting you know sunlight on our faces drying out the areas that have been moist from the mask that's it's not healthy to be masking all the time um, and probably a lot of the illness is getting spread by over masking but you know encouraging people when we're outside and distant we really only need those masks inside as you suggest open businesses and that's the only role they have at this point all the masking studies that have looked at this it's been indoor in poorly ventilated spaces. So to say, well, if it, it's helpful here, let's expand to this place where it has no effectiveness, it, it, it's not helpful. So I think really encouraging people, you know, read the mask mandate. Don't be afraid of people outdoors with their mask on that are 20 feet from you. It's, it's not possible to transmit the virus 20 feet away. It's, it's, you know, I remind my patients too, it's when the CDC said, yes, in fact, this is an airborne illness, they didn't mean it was atmospheric. It's not floating around the minute we walk out of our houses. It means that person to person in a poorly ventilated space, it can get transmitted through the air. That's what we mean by airborne. It's not floating around. And, and I find that a lot of my patients are really calmed by that because that is what they understood the news to say, that the minute they open their front door, they're at risk or sitting in their backyard, they're at risk that it's gonna get them out of the air. It's just not the way it works. Wow, so, well, that's interesting. Uh, and you're right, though. I mean, even the San Diego County, where, where I read the mask mandate, where it's, if you're outside and you're not going to be socially distanced or you have a social distance, you don't right. have to have the mask on. They encourage you to keep one in your pocket right. or under your car seat, under your car seat, either yeah. one, but, but to have, have it available. Okay, I heard, now this wasn't from a doctor, this was from a restaurateur who said that the rate of flu, I guess, occurrences so far to date this year are down and they kind of attributed that to the mask wearing. I, I don't know if that's, I don't, is that a stretch or is that? I think that's a stretch. And the reason is because, you know, the, people have looked at masks for decades. There's been almost five decades of randomized control trials on wearing masks to try to uh, lessen influenza pandemics. So it's not just in 2020 that we got this magical idea that masks might be helpful. Um, you know, scientists have been looking at that for decades. And the literature was very clear that, that universal masking did not have a role in decreasing influenza pandemics. Early on, when uh, places like Singapore was masking in their health uh, care centers, um, they didn't find a decreased transmission of influenza at the same time that they were trying to protect against SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. um, and I think really where we're getting most of the decrease in flu so far is it's just a reporting, it's a reporting error. I mean, it, it hasn't just, you know, gone down a little bit, which is if masks were effective in that realm, it would go down a little bit. It's gone down like almost 100%. It's almost 0%. So it's wow. probably that we're not really testing for it. There are some combined tests that um, are now available that test for flu and COVID at the same time. Um, but it's probably just a, an underdiagnosis. And I, I myself know a lot of people who've taken their kids to get COVID tested because they were sick. They were sure they had it because they had a fever. They didn't have COVID, so they brought them home and they sat at home a couple days until they were done being sick. But they didn't then say, let's do a flu test. They just said, thank goodness it's not COVID, and they went home. So we're probably missing a lot of flu diagnoses. Wow. Well, do you have something, I mean, being, you know, a doctor, you're, you're not an epidemiologist. Nope. But, and so 
I, I'm sure I'll get pushed back for you know putting a non epidemiologist on, on on a podcast, but <laughs> but I guess sure. I don't I don't know any epidemiologists who treat patients, so there's there's also that caveat. It's it's easy to look at numbers. Mm -hmm. It's hard to treat people get across your desk and care for them and help them still have a life while keeping them as low risk as possible. So that's what I would say about the epidemiologist comment. I can get out statistics and we can talk about that, but it's nothing like taking care of patients and being responsible for them. Wow, very good point. I, I didn't realize that. There was a difference. Yeah. I, uh, in, okay. Um, Miles, you got you want to kind of wrap us up? and, and well, yeah. um, We're learning all sorts of things, Dr. Clark. Supervisor yeah. Desmond and I are not, we're nowhere near doctors, so we're just asking questions and then we get flack for and we say, we don't know, we're just trying to learn. <laughs> um, what, you've kind of touched on it, but I, I guess kind of like to sum it up, what, what's your message to people who are scared to go outside, who think this is worse, or who think this isn't anything? I mean, what, just what's your message to San Diegans, Californians, the American people? You know, everything with moderation, and it fits here too. This isn't, you know, phony. This is real. It's not the end of the world. Um, some people are at more risk, just like flu. I mean, flu kills a lot of seniors every year, you know, sometimes up to upwards of three to four, three, 30 to 40,000. So this is very serious for a small group of people. For the vast majority of people, it's not. And I think the biggest message is it's not floating around trying to get us. I don't want people to be panicked to go outside. It's important to go out and get fresh air. It's important to take a break from your mask. Um, it's important to not be fearful of people who are outside without masks. Um, so I would just say, you know, read that mandate. It's based on public health recommendations. And even our state of California doesn't recommend wearing a mask every time you step foot outside of your house. So I think it's a good reminder. The last thing I would leave you with too is I find it's helpful when we talk about what the CDC um, defines as an exposure. So when we're going back and contact tracing, the CDC defines an exposure as being in close proximity to somebody, um, which is about six feet usually, for cumulative 15 minutes during a day. So, you know, the concept that you would get it from somebody in the market that you're passing by, you know, it's just very unlikely. So there are a lot of things we do that wouldn't count for contact. And what the CDC is telling you is, you're not gonna catch it from that casual contact. We really get this indoors. Um, and the, the CDC doesn't even make a, diff, a distinction between masks or unmasked at that short distance. They don't say, oh, well, if it's a mask, it doesn't count. It's masked or unmasked. They don't see it as any different if you're at that close proximity. So just understanding where we are at risk and minimizing those activities and understanding where we're not at risk. Get out and exercise get fresh air, and you don't have to wear a mask while you do that. Just follow the mandate. It's a good guide, and so is the CDC. All right. Well, thank you so much, Doctor. I really appreciate, it, you know, your time and your effort and, and your input and common sense, uh, you know, trying to get, you know, do the right things. And, and you're, you're right. This is a real disease. We have to deal with it, and, and, uh, but we have to, uh, you know, do, do it realistically and, and follow those CDC guidelines, but just, you know, know, know that there's – it's going to over. It's going to get over someday. Uh, we just don't know when, but uh, we just got to keep taking the precautions. So thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was nice to meet you both.